Okay. Uh, there's much more we can do with the mind-body problem if we wanted to. But I want to make sure I get through all the material that I have planned for the semester. Whatever's left on the back end, we'll go back to the mind-body problem. Uh, if you remember, Descartes is one of the continental rationalists. Rationalism believes you know the world through your mind, through ideas. <coughs> and that you can't trust your sensory experience. And that knowledge is a priori, prior to any specific sensory experience. The opposite of that is an empiricist who believes that all knowledge arises out of experience. And all knowledge is a posteriori, which means all knowledge derives from experience. You can only know whether something's true or false uh, through your observation. It's the exact opposite of uh, rationalism. And we're going to first look at Locke, John Locke, one of the three British empiricists. Uh, the other two are uh, Hume, which we'll look at later, and uh, Barclay, which we won't look at, but you can read about in the book. So just to remind you again, rationalism believes that knowledge is derived through reason and innate ideas as we saw in Descartes. And then innate ideas are ideas present at birth and it's a priori, prior to any specific sensory experience. <coughs> as opposed to a priori, truth or falsity can be known independently of observation. So this is rationalism, and empiricism is exactly the opposite. Locke says that knowledge is restricted to ideas. Now, not platonic ideas or forms. He's using the word idea differently than obviously we used it when we were discussing Plato. For Locke, ideas are generated by objects of experience. And that's what the cartoon is trying to demonstrate. If you look at the cartoon and stop writing for a moment. <clears throat> Before there was a light bulb, and you know in cartoons an idea is represented by a light bulb. This is how ideas were represented. They didn't have a light bulb by fire. It has to be, uh, ideas can only be generated by objects of our experience. So the origin of ideas for Locke is experience. And experience gives rise to two types of ideas. Sensation and reflection. So experience gives rise to two types of ideas, sensation and reflection. Sensation is the result of your senses. Reflection is your mind thinking about those experiences. <clears throat> so sensation is our perceptions of external objects. Reflection is what the mind does with those reflections. It works on them. It's perception. It's knowing. It's thinking. It's doubting. It's reasoning. It's willing. It's believing. Reflection is the mind taking notice of its own operations, but without experience, without sensation, there's nothing for the mind to reflect on. Uh, there's something known as sensory deprivation experiments. You put someone in a water tank, in an enclosed room, in a closed... <coughs> enclosed what? Capsule. And you have them floating in the water. They can't see anything, they can't hear anything. And they're floating in water, so there's no sense of gravity on your body. 
All their sensory apparatus is useless. What do you think happens after a time? Go to sleep? No. You don't go to sleep. In sensory deprivation experiments, what happens is first you hallucinate. And then you go bonkers. The mind deprived of sensation goes bonkers. So the mind has to have something to work on. And for Locke, the only material it has to work on are the information given to it by its senses. For Locke, you're born with a mind that's a blank slate. No innate ideas. It's called the tableau, tabla rasa. Blank tablet, blank slate. Ain't nothing in your mind when you're born. No innate ideas. <clears throat> now, you know I argued for the existence of innate ideas when I did Descartes. And I sort of convinced you of it. Now I've got to convince you of the opposite. Not that I have to do it, but Locke has to do it. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So there are no innate ideas. Everything comes from your sensory experience. He says, look, there are some things we know that are absolutely true. Cannot be denied. The first thing is, what is, is. That's called the principle of identity or the principle of non-contradiction. A thing cannot be itself and its opposite at the same time. That is so obvious, you would think that we come to the world knowing that. And even though it's certain, Locke's going to argue it's not innate. And he says, look, it's obvious when you come into the world, you experience things. And it takes a long time to come to the notion that a thing can't be its opposite at the same time, so why call it innate? Uh, in psychology, there, there's a psychologist uh, named Piaget. Well, I understand with respect to child psychology is sort of passe like Freud is. But he, but he has a few ideas that I particularly are fond of. And one is called object permanence. When a child is of a certain age, if you take an object and you show it to the kid, okay? and you pick up some cups, and you show the kid you're putting it under one of the cups, and cover it, the kid starts going crazy and crying. We're assuming it's his favorite toy. Why is that? He saw you put it there. Because when children are very, very young, infants, the only things that exist are the things they perceive. If they can't see it, it doesn't exist anymore. <coughs> When they reach another level, and I forgot the ages when these take place, do the exact same thing. The kid is now a little older, got a favorite toy. You walk behind the screen so the kid can't see where you're putting it. And you put it under a cup, and then you raise the screen. What do you think the kid does? Can't hear you. He still freaks out because he can't see anything. No. After a certain, a certain age, they develop what's called object permanence. They know just because I can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You pull up the screen, the kid goes over to the cups and knocks them all down until he finds it. I mean, you know that things exist when you don't see them, right? How do you know that? I mean, an example is this. This morning I filled up the ice trays, I put them in the freezer. What do I expect to find when I get home? Ice. Ice! But what happens if there's no ice? What happens if the refrigerator stopped working? What happens if my neighbor came and took my ice? You don't know something exists because you don't see it. You believe it, and you have good reason to believe it because your experience tells you things don't disappear. called object permanence. Object permanence is real 
whether you're aware of it or not. So the kid learns over time about object permanence. So it can't be innate. Even though we know it's true. It's just like the law of identity. We know it's true, but how do you get to that conclusion? It takes time. So why call it innate? So once the mind reflects on the nature of things, you can't think otherwise. So even if they exist prior to your existence, these things, you don't become aware of it until your mind reaches a certain state of maturity. Another example, when kids are little, you'll put a nickel in one hand and a dime in the other hand, tell them to take one. Which one do they take? The bigger one. They take the bigger one. Later on, they realize there's a difference in value. Well, that value has always existed. So why... Why well, think of the, the ability to quantify things as being innate if it takes time before the mind matures? It's that simple. So they're not innate. Because you cannot come into the world and not experience things. So all your ideas come from your sensory experience. They're not innate. Now, one of the reasons that Locke wants to get rid of innate ideas is because they can lead to the unexamined life. What does that mean? Well, if ideas are innate, you don't have to examine them. If you're born with the idea of X, Y, and Z, you don't question them. And that can lead to a multiplicity of problems. And so, he wants to get rid of innate ideas because he doesn't want you to accept anything on face value. You need to contemplate about ideas. And if they're innate, you don't. So this is the way it works. Experience gives rise to sensations. Sensations give rise to ideas. And then the mind reflects on these ideas. So, without ideas, there's nothing to reflect on. You only can have ideas through experience because it's your experience that gives rise to sensations, and sensations give rise to ideas. Everything depends on experience. Now, this is a far cry from Plato. And it's a far cry from Descartes. It's a whole different way of looking at things. It's actually going back to the Aristotelian view of things where uh, form and matter are always found <coughs> together. And you abstract things through your experiences. Okay, where? So, off. Uh, Locke has made this argument against innate ideas. He wants to make a clear distinction between prejudice, enthusiasm, opinion, and knowledge. He wants to make a clear distinction between prejudice, enthusiasm, opinion, and knowledge. I want you to understand there's a difference between these things. In addition, because ideas are the result of a sensation or reflection, ideas are either simple or complex. So, ideas are the result of sensation, reflection is the mind reflecting on the sensation, the ideas, and ideas are either simple or complex. So on the test, uh, there may be a question that says, what types of ideas are there for Locke? Simple and complex would be the answer. <coughs> What's a simple idea as opposed to a complex idea? A simple idea is an idea that's received passively through the senses. And the mind receives the ideas one at a time. What does this mean? Your eyes pass 
passively transmit photons. They can't help it. Unless it's pitch black out. If there's any light around, which your eyes can detect, they passively pass that light onto the brain. You are not selecting what comes in and what goes out. And, and what are these simple ideas? Well, color, taste, texture. These are simple ideas that come to the mind one at a time. So what do you expect the complex ideas? When those three are taken out all at once. Yeah, when the mind combines simple ideas, you get complex ideas. Very good. Now, simple ideas can arise from reflection as well. Pain, pleasure, power. So simple ideas come through experience when your senses pick up their experiences one at a time passively, but they can also arise from reflection, such as pain, pleasure, and power. <clears throat> Complex ideas of joining together with simple ideas. So, you have the simple idea of whiteness, hardness, and sweetness. You put them all together and you wind up with sugar. Sugar is a complex idea. But what constitutes the sugar, it's simple ideas, it's color, it's hardness, it's sweetness, are all simple ideas. And by combining simple ideas, you arrive at complex ideas. And it's the mind that does this. It's the mind that joins things together. It reflects on the simple ideas combines them and comes up with a complex idea. I mean, how do you know a sugar cube is a sugar cube? Because it's white, hard, and sweet. Yeah, you have to, you know, but when you look at a sugar cube, you can see it's white, and you may, but you don't know it's hard. So you have to have the experience that it's hard. And you don't know it's sweet unless you taste it. By the way, you know why you lick ice cream and don't eat it? You don't eat ice cream, you, you don't like it, right? How come? Because it's going to be cold when you bite it. It's, it's cold when you lick it. Sometimes you get a brain freeze anyway. Why do you like ice cream? It's not a solid. What? It's not really a solid. It's not really a solid? Well, I mean, well but you, you, you chew cottage cheese. Okay. You chew... Jello, unless you like me, just let it melt in your mouth and then swallow it. But yeah, there are things that are semi solids that you chew. Why do you think you lick ice cream? Okay, let me ask you this. How many things can you actually taste? You know what? How many things can you actually taste? You don't know. No, four things. Yeah. I heard someone mumble. What'd you mumble? Um, four things. I said uh, bitter, sweet, bitter, sweet, sweet, sour, sour, and hot, sweet, salt. Okay. Sweet, <clears throat> salt, sour, bitter. All your tastes are a combination of those four, along with your olfactory senses, your ability to smell. When you have a cold, what does food taste like? Nothing. Nothing. It's bland. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. They work together. Your four taste buds are located in different areas of your tongue. Think about when you taste something really sour, which side of your mouth hurts. Left or right? Next time, think about it. Your sense of sweetness, tip of your tongue. Why do you eat ice cream? Because it is rich in sugar and fat, which makes it sweet. You lick it. Here's an experiment to try with someone. Blindfold them so they can't see. 
put a clothespin over their nose so they can't smell, and have them eat something. It'll taste bland. Blindfold them, have them smell an orange, and eat an apple, and ask them to describe the taste. And it'll taste like an orange with a funny consistency. So it takes your senses working in combination for taste and for other things as well. Uh, we talk about four senses or five senses. We see, we smell, we taste, we hear, and we feel. And we always talk, joke about the sixth sense. And the sixth sense is what? ESP when they're talking about it. But we have more than five senses. We, we have one sense that you don't even think about, but it's very important. And it works in combination with another sense. It's your sense of balance. You never think about it, because it works so well usually. You have no trouble putting one foot in front of the other and walking without falling down. But that's because your sense of balance. What happens to your sense of balance when you close your eyes? Anyone know? Who's healthy here? Who has good legs and isn't healthy and, and, and isn't uh, got bad knees, bad ankles, or anything? Anybody? Okay, come up here. And it's not bashful. Okay. Why don't you stand right there, face the audience, face the audience, and hop on one leg. No, continually hop on one leg. Okay. Got it? Now do that with your eyes closed. And watch what happens. See all the traveling he's doing? He's traveling on, well now he's got it. But you see how he traveled? The first time he did it, he started on this square and ended in this square, and now he's on this square. Thank you. Your, your sense of balance works with your sense of vision. So it's our senses that allow us to negotiate our way through the world. It's our senses that create sensations, which create ideas, which the mind can work on. Complex ideas. Again, as Aristotle says, that we know universals because we abstract it from the things we meet in the world through our experience. I mean, he's really one of the first empiricists. Again, cessation is the perceptions of external objects. <coughs> from sensations, we abstract to general terms, general ideas about things. So, we know the complex notion of man, the idea of man, because we abstract it from our experience of meeting individual men. So when we talk about man, we know what it means to be man because we met individual men who abstract the idea. And as I said when we were talking about Aristotle, there are some problems with that. Because you should be able to tell me what you're abstracting. So when I meet an individual person, I see their shape, I see their form, I see how they're put together. Uh, we basically have two arms, we're bipedal. We have stereoscopic vision. The only difference between us and an upright walking ape is how much hair we have. You know, obviously there are other differences. How do we know that apes just aren't another form of man? have the same characteristics that you can see. Obviously, we check the DNA, we see the DNA is different. Not all that different, just slightly different. So this idea of abstraction from meeting individual things has a difficulty. But this is how we basically function in the world. This is why sometimes we make mistakes in classifying things. We don't see the differences, we only see the similarities. And we make mistakes sometimes. Uh, I think I've used the example in class before. Uh, most of us originally, when we see a hyena, we think it's a what? What group does a hyena belong to when we first look at it? A dog. And it's not. It's more closely related to a cat. 
if you look at whales and if you look at male, uh, uh, dolphins, uh, they look just like a funny kind of fish. We look at sharks and we think they're, they're not, but we think they're fish because on the surface you can't tell the difference. You don't realize they don't have true gills and you don't realize that they have no bones. They're all cartilage. Everything that we think of as bone is cartilage in the shark. And it has no scales. But when you look at it, you don't know that. Panda bears look like bears and so we used to think they were bears and we thought they actually belonged to the raccoon family. But now we think they belong to the bear family again. We sometimes make mistakes through these abstractions, but mostly we don't. We get through the world fairly well. Another type of complex idea are relationships. X is bigger than Y. That's a complex idea because we have the sensation of X, we have the sensation of Y, and we're making a comparison between the two. It's the mind doing this. It's a complex idea. Logical relationships are complex ideas. Mathematical relations are complex ideas. Now, the interesting thing about mathematical relationships is we never experience what? Who can you never have an experience of when you're talking about math? What part of mathematical relationships don't exist in the world? Numbers. Numbers. Numbers are abstractions. At least for us. <coughs> Obviously, if you're Pythagoras, they're real. So they are abstractions. And the relationship between abstractions are, in fact, complex ideas. <clears throat> There's another distinction he makes. And this one he's making because he wants to make a distinction between appearances and reality. The first distinction he makes is to eliminate innate ideas so that we can make a distinction between opinion, enthusiasm, prejudice, and knowledge. The second distinction he's going to make, because he wants to make a distinction between appearances and reality. At this point, we know that things are not necessarily the way they look. And he does this by introducing a notion that's called primary and secondary qualities. <clears throat> and this is an attempt to explain the relationship between objects and ideas. Primary qualities exist in the objects themselves. And the sensations, meaning the ideas, produced by primary qualities have an exact one-to-one -one relationship. And they resemble exactly those qualities. So a primary quality exists in the object itself. Uh, l let me uh, talk about objective and subjective for a moment so you understand how the terms are being used. <clears throat> objective, in one sense, is like an objective test, like a multiple choice test. We call them objective tests because my opinion doesn't enter into it. The answer is either right or wrong. It doesn't matter. That object, what we call objective tests really are, in another sense, subjective because I know what answer I'm looking for. And that's the only right answer. Subjective means belonging to me. I'm imposing myself on things. Well, that's not how Locke is using it. For Locke, an objective quality is one that belongs to the object itself and is independent of anyone observing it. Okay? So, what's an objective quality about me? What is there about me that belongs to me that's independent of anything else? It's anything that can be measured. So how tall I am is not dependent on you. I am whatever I am. And I tell people I'm five foot ten and a half. 
That half inch is important because it makes me taller than my brother. And as a younger brother, you always want to be bigger than your older brother. And I'm bigger than my older brother now. And want more weights than one. <clears throat> Objective means belonging to the object. Subjective means belonging to the subject. So you always have to keep that in mind when we're talking about lock. Uh, you cannot use your everyday notion and understanding of the words. Okay? So, primary qualities are those things, those qualities exist in the objects themselves. So how tall I am belongs to me independent of anything else. How much I weigh belongs to me independent of anything else. Anything that you can measure is a primary quality because that's independent of anybody else. Primary qualities are things like number, how many, solidity, extension, size, mobility, the ability to move, shape, or figure. These are all primary qualities. Now, interesting thing about that, one of my students one brought, once brought up, well, if I look at this table from one perspective, its shape is a rectangle. If I look at it another, it becomes a diamond. Well, my perspective is changing, not the shape of the table. Okay? Because that belongs to the object itself. It's independent of me. If you can measure it, it's a primary quality. belongs to the object. So what do you think might be what do you call secondary qualities? If primary qualities belong to the object independent of the subject, what do you think secondary qualities are? Things that we have in common. Yes. Have in common. Good idea, but that's not it. Ideas, that's not it either. Ideas can be generated either by primary qualities or secondary qualities. What do you think that did? Someone else, come on, think. What do you think he caps on? If primary qualities belong to the subject, uh, the object, and an independent of the subject, what do you think secondary qualities are? Things you observe. What? The things you observe about it. Yeah. It has to do with the relationship between the subject and the object. So what do you think might be something that's dependent on us when we look at an object? It's certainly not anything that can be measured that's independent. So what kind of quality do you think would be what we call secondary qualities? Like the table. Yeah. Like, from which angle you view it. Well, yeah, but that doesn't change its real shape. It's the things you sense, right? Like colors. Like what? Like colors. Bingo. Like color. Where does color reside? In the object? Or in the subject? Subject. <clears throat> we did the daisy in here, didn't we? Oh, you didn't see my artistic ability in this class? Huh. Like I always say, I'm the worst person to ask what goes on in the classroom. Because I never remember. Everyone can see the board? You know, people run this stuff down to the nub and don't replace it. What is that? A flower. What? A flower. Yeah, what kind? It's a daisy. <clears throat> Normally, what color is this? What color is this? Yellow. Yellow. Why is that a secondary quality, not a primary quality? Remember, remember, primary quality is what belongs to the, sub, uh, the object, the thing itself. We decided that a secondary quality has to do with our relationship to the thing. Things that are dependent upon us. So why isn't yellow and white color a primary quality? Because color 
Because what we see. Because what we see. We see it as white and what does this guy see it as? <clears throat> turns out to be black. So when the bees flying by this daisy, he sees purple and black. What color is the flower really? Is it purple and black or white and yellow? What's its real color? Yes. What? Yes. What's its real color? Yes. No. It's dependent on the subject. I can't hear you. You're mumbling. It's dependent on the subject. That's right. That's why it's a secondary quality. It depends what the light spectrum is of the apparatus looking at it. We cannot see ultraviolet light. Bees do. So the flower is neither white, nor purple, nor yellow, or black. The quality that belongs to the flower is what light it is absorbing and what light it's reflecting. How we interpret the reflected light belongs to the subject. Does everyone see that? So it is absorbing certain light waves and reflecting others. Which ones you see depend upon the apparatus that's looking at it. And that's why it's a secondary <coughs> quality. The ability to reflect and absorb light belongs to the flower. And we can measure because we can measure wavelengths. So we know what it's reflecting. But what you see depends on, in our case, our limitations. <coughs> Sound. Primary, secondary. 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 Because what a dog can hear, we can't hear. So anything that depends on our apparatus is a secondary quality. Remember I said he does this to make a <coughs> distinction between appearances and reality. What's real, primary or secondary qualities? Primary. Primary. What's appearances? Secondary qualities. Secondary qualities. They're dependent on the nature of the subject. And they have no exact counterpart in the object. Color, sound, taste, odor. All the things that come through our senses that are dependent upon the limitations of our senses. And the way we see and understand the world is based on the limitations of our sensory apparatus. We miss so much of the world because of the limits of our sensory apparatus. We don't hear things, we don't smell things, we don't taste things. It's just incredible how limited our view of the world is.
So the importance of this distinction, again, between primary and secondary qualities is so that we understand there's a difference between appearance and reality. And as you can tell from this little picture on the screen, that all men are liars. Isn't that true? All men are liars? You can see that here, can't you? This proves it. What do you see? I see uh, the white lines. What do you right. see? It says liar. It says liar. Does everyone see that it says liar? And does everyone see his uh, sort of a, a line sketch of a man's almost profile three quarter? Everyone see the man in the world? Oh, okay, great. But nobody reacted. Why well, you all not recovered from the election? Is that it? That's why we're so quiet today. You learn something from this election. It's one of the things you learn from this election. That we can never let it happen again. You what? <laughs> we can never let it happen again. I <laughs> know. <laughs> that, that shows your inclination as to who you voted for. Uh, no, it doesn't. But it doesn't matter what the people, <laughs> what the people say. No, it does. It You're talking about because she won a few votes more in the popular vote? This election. <laughs> It's the Electoral College, but you still, in fact, can vote who goes into the Electoral College. Oh, I, don't want to start, I didn't want to start an argument. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. No, you're right. Uh, she, look, uh, when uh, Bush won his first term, Gore had more votes. This time she had more votes. In their infinite wisdom, the founding fathers, who did not trust the electorate at all, set up the Electoral College so the big states the highly populated states have more impact on an election than small states. I mean, that's all it is. It has to do with population. Okay? Uh, shouldn't New York and California have a greater say in what the hell goes on in the country than a bunch of little tiny states that don't have the same things in, in, as interest and important to them? That's why they set it up that way. Uh, no, I was talking about polls. This is the worst polling miscue since 1948 when Truman beat Dewey. The day after the election, there's a picture of uh, Truman riding down an open car with a parade with a newspaper whose headline from the Chicago Tribune, I think, says, Dewey defeats Truman. <laughs> because all the polls had Dewey up by 10 points. And it was when polling was, was in its infancy. And they called thousands and thousands of people. Now polls are 1,200 people. But then they did thousands of people. They called them up. And they all said they were voting for Dewey. Dewey. And only in retrospect do you figure out why the polls were so off. Who had phones in 1948? What demographic? The rich. The rich. The well-to-do. <coughs> So they were looking at people who had money, and they were voting for Dewey. In the 70s, there was a well-loved and respected four-term mayor of Los Angeles named Thomas Bradley. He was a black mayor, and he rose from the ranks of policemen, the police commissioner, got a law degree, got elected four times as mayor of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, ran for governor, and all the polls had him up between 8 and 10 points the day before the election. Have you ever heard of Governor Bradley? He didn't get elected. Duke Machen got elected. And it took him a while to figure it out. When people were asked, oh, who are you voting for? They said, I'm voting for Bradley. Why? Why would someone say they're voting for Bradley and they weren't going to vote for Bradley? Go ahead. I'm decisive. What? I'm decisive. No. I don't want people to know that they were going to vote for the other side. Why? Ridicule them. What? Ridicule them. Ridicule? Yeah. Why, well, you're close. 
People thought if I told the poster I was voting for Duke Machen, they'd think I was a racist. It's called the Bradley effect. That people lie to posters for vari a variety of reasons. That's one of the things that happened here. When they asked who you were voting for, they said Clinton. And they had all the intentions in the world to vote for Trump. They didn't want to appear to be maybe racist, anti-woman, a bigot. So they, and that's part of what happened. There's a lot of other things that happened. We didn't realize the depth of uh, anger uh, of the disenfranchised, the unemployed uh, people who really did resent a black president. People who don't really think women should be in power. We, we underestimated that. So, the moral of the story is, don't trust polls. There's only one poll that counts. The one on election day. And that's another thing about polls. If your candidate is 10 points ahead, are you more or less likely to vote? Less likely to vote. The other thing you have to understand, <clears throat> if you have a party in power for eight years in the presidency, it's very hard for a member of that party to win the next election. It's very rarely happened. It happened when Bush followed uh, Reagan. But other than that, you, very find, you, hard, you hardly ever find a third-term same party president. Now we only have to hope that the Republic survives intact. We'll see if the office really makes the man. And we'll also see how much power a president actually has. Because constitutionally, where's all the power? In the presidency or in Congress? Congress. Congress. And we'll see if Congress has a spine and a backbone. It'll be interesting. It's an old Buddhist curse. You should live in an interesting time. Boy, are you in it. Okay, differences in between appearance and reality. <clears throat> it's really important to make that distinction and to understand there really is a difference between appearances and reality. The appearances were that she was going to win the election in a walk. I mean, some people had her getting 394 electoral votes. Only CNN and, the, I'm sorry, the USC um, <coughs> poll had him winning the electoral college. Okay. Remember, when we first looked at Thales, what was he concerned with? The differences between appearances and reality. So this is an ongoing thing throughout the whole history of philosophy. It still is. So, reality is not in color, which is only in effect. Reality is in the cause, motion, which in this case, color is light. So color is not that which you see, not the red. It's the movement of photons and the wavelengths. That's the reality. But we don't see wavelengths. We see wavelengths as... We see wavelengths as what? Color, not as wavelengths. So what wavelengths are being reflected belongs to the object. What wavelengths we see belongs to us. And that's why it's a secondary quality. Now we're back to the word substance. Remember for Descartes, substance is something which exists but that needs no other thing for its existence. Hence we have the mind and the body problem. For Aristotle, substance is that which contains the form and matter. For Locke, substance is that which gives rise to sensation, which means it possesses both primary and secondary qualities. <clears throat> I mean, if there are primary qualities and secondary qualities, which obviously there are, according to Locke, something has to possess those qualities. 
And he calls the thing that has, possesses primary and secondary qualities a substance. That's the meaning of the word. It's that which possesses the ability to evoke primary and secondary qualities. No matter what you call it, and he calls it substance, but I, he could call it something else. If primary and secondary qualities actually exist, they have to reside in something, do they not? And he chose to call that which they reside in substance. Now, We've arrived at the notion that if some, if there are primary and secondary qualities, they have to do, reside in something. Do I actually experience substance, or do I ex experience primary and secondary qualities? What do I have experience of? Substance or primary and secondary qualities? Hello? I only... I only have experience of primary and secondary qualities. I don't have the experience of that which they reside in, only the effects. But there must be something that they reside in. That's logical. <clears throat> Logically, you cannot have primary and secondary qualities unless they reside in something. He calls it substance. So this idea of substance is not a product of experience. But he says all things are a product of experience. He says, no, this is a product what he calls demonstrative knowledge. Which obviously now he's going to make a distinction between different types of knowledge. I can demonstrate that substance exists. It doesn't matter that I call it substance. I can demonstrate that there must be something in which primary and secondary qualities reside. He calls it substance. Well, it makes perfect sense. We just did it. And so, he gives us three types of knowledge. Intuitive, demonstrative, and sensitive. Excuse me? Demonstrative. I can't hear you. I said, I thought it was called demonstrative. No, it's demonstrative. <clears throat> sensitive knowledge. And obviously you need to know what the three things are. So what does he mean by intuitive knowledge? It's immediate and without doubt. Almost sounds like they call it. A circle is not a square. Six is not eight. Mathematical truths. I exist. This is Cartesian. Same things that are intuitive knowledge for Locke or almost innate ideas for Descartes. But what does Locke say? He says it takes time, a maturity. Huh. Why can't I see my title? Okay. It takes time for the mind to mature to come to these intuitive things. So I call them innate. Does everyone understand that? These are ideas that Descartes would call innate. Locke says, wait a minute. When you come into the world, you don't know about mathematical truths. You don't know six is not eight. You don't know you exist. You don't know a circle is not a square. But at some point, these things become immediately obvious to you, but only after the mind matures, so it takes time, and while the mind is maturing, you're in the world and you're experiencing things, so there's no reason to call it innate. So that's intuitive knowledge. Demonstrative knowledge. It's really logical knowledge, logical truth. Intuitively know that nothing cannot give rise to something. From nothing you get nothing. <clears throat> and if that's the case, and you've seen this argument several times, 
if you can get nothing from nothing, there always has to have been something floating around, or there would be nothing here. If at one time there was nothing, now there would still be nothing. But obviously we're here. So obviously there must always have been at least something, something one thing. And of course, the only thing that could be eternal is God. So I don't experience God through my senses, but I can demonstrate the existence of God. Or, if you want to put it in non-religious terms, you can argue for the existence that there is something that exists that's eternal. Now, from a scientific perspective, that which is eternal is matter and energy. It's not God. And because of the laws, the physical laws that matter and energy can ne neither be created nor destroyed, one of the laws of thermodynamics, then all the energy in the world and all the matter in the world has always existed. So it's eternal. So it doesn't matter whether you call it God or not. Obviously, he's the 17th century. What is he going to call it? That which is eternal. He's going to call it God. And he would be referring, I suspect, to the Judaic Christian notion of God. But it doesn't have to be. But there has to be something that's always existed. We in the 21st century, not all of us, but the prevailing academic view, no, that's the word, wrong word, the pre prevailing view of those who dabble in physics is that it's matter and energy that's eternal, not God. Because we're looking at it from a scientific point of view, not a religious point of view. Religion doesn't hold the same sway over our society as it did in uh, the 17th century. So demonstrative knowledge, logical truth. If extension and solidity are primary qualities, they have to subsist or exist in something. He calls it substance. Both substance and God are inferences. For Descartes, they're innate ideas. For Locke, I'm demonstrating the existence of substance in God, not through experience, because I should have to do that if I'm empiricist, not through innateness, but through logical argumentation. Everyone follows the argument, right? No trouble following his, his argument says A and B exist. They need to exist in something. So I'm proving the existence of something. Call it... Call it... Ishkabibble. So A and B exist. A and B have to exist in something, and the something they exist in is Ishkabibble. So I can prove through logic the existence of Ishkabibble. Does everyone follow that now? If something has always had to exist, it's got to be eternal. The only thing that we think of as eternal in the 17th century is called God. Those are the arguments. And there's sensitive knowledge. Now, sensitive knowledge is called knowledge, but it's not certain knowledge. It actually should be with a small k, not a large k. And the reason uh, sensitive knowledge can't be certain is because it's supplied by the senses, and the senses are fallible. However, the senses do give us an understanding, give rise to an awareness of qualities. Well, if it's our senses that perceive qualities, either primary or secondary, that means things outside of us must do what? If my ideas come through sensations, which are my sensory experience, there must be something that's causing the sensory experience. So those things must do what? exists. Unlike Descartes who had to go through a long convoluted argument to find out that the external world exists, for Locke it's quite, it's a much simpler fact. The fact is, I sense things in the world, so things in the world must exist or I couldn't sense them. No one can argue you can sense everything through your imagination, uh, but if there's no material for your imagination, your mind is actually what? Where 
does your imagination come from? The mind. The mind. If there's no sensations entering the mind and or the brain, you can't imagine anything. Because your mind would be empty. So it's only through your experience that you can even have imagination. Imagination is your mind working on your sensory information. So now we know things exist. So that's his epistemology. Now we're going to take a quick look at his ethical view. And what is that? For Locke, the good is understood to be that which promotes pleasure or diminishes pain. That coincides with another philosophical school known as utilitarianism. Good is associated with pleasure, evil is associated with pain. And therefore, morality has to do with choosing or willing the good. Which means, and this is a quote, moral good and evil then is only the conformity or disagreement of our voluntary actions to some law. So when you read someone talking about some law, what's the next thing that person has to do? Prove it to be committed. Yeah, to demonstrate there are different laws. So, good is understood to be that which promotes pleasure or diminishes pain. And therefore, morality has to do with choosing or willing the good and moral good and evil, then, is only the conformity or disagreement of our voluntary actions to some law. So obviously there are different kinds of law for law, just as though there were different kinds of knowledge. Philosophers love the number three for some reason. There are three types of law. The law of opinion, those are called mores. Not morals, but mores. Civil law, which is legal, and divine law, gods. So, moral good and evil then is simply to con voluntarily conforming to one of these three laws, or not. Mores. What are mores? Mores are cultural customs. For example. If I'm at the dinner table and I belch, what's expected of me? What? I, you know, can we? I'm deaf. Speak up. Do you say excuse me? Yeah, say excuse me. And if don't, you're considered rude. rude. If you happen to pass gas at the dinner table, what are you supposed to do? You blame it on somebody else. <laughs> what? Blame it on somebody else. Yes. You got it. Dog. My God. The dog. God. The dog can't defend itself. I'm supposed to say excuse me. Uh, if someone puts a steak in front of you, how are you expected to eat it? Knife and fork. Knife and fork. Now, if you're in Turkey and you're at a commoner's house, and you're invited for dinner. What's not on the table? A knife and fork. How do you eat? Yes. And do you eat from your own bowl or a common bowl? You eat from a common bowl. We in the United States would never, you know, it's worse than double dipping. Double dipping. I mean, I stick my <laughs> fingers in there and then I stick them in again and six other people do it. You wouldn't put your fingers in there and eat it. Those are mores. Those are customs. Uh, eating with uh, metal utensils or eating with chopsticks are mores. Okay? Uh, a more, uh, and on a more serious note, if you're walking down the block and the house is on fire, not yours, but somebody else's, what does the community expect you to do? At least minimally call. Right? If you see one person beating up another, what does the community expect you to do? Stop it. Try to stop it. Those are mores. 
Because there's no civil law, there's no legal law that says you have to call if the house is on fire, and there's no law that says you have to break up a fight. So those are mores. Law of opinion. And the reason you obey voluntarily in most cases is laws of opinions which you don't want your neighbors to look down on you or think badly of you. Civil law. Legal laws. Legal laws are funny. We obey all those laws that we think are in our own self-best interest or the consequences of violating them are greater than the pleasure derived from not by, for violating them. So, civil laws. We obey all those civil laws that we think are in our self-best interest. And we obey civil laws based on the fact that the pleasure derived from breaking them is counteracted by the severity of the punishment for breaking them. That is voluntary. Now, I know there are some civil laws that you break all the time. And we talked about one. You even know that it's called the California Rolling Stop. stop. You've all heard the expression, right? Yeah. And I was surprised that that's what you call it in Arizona, California Rolling Stop. You come to a four-way stop sign at 12 o'clock at night, you don't stop, you slow down, make sure there's no traffic, and then and you go right through it. But if you came to the same corner that didn't have any stop signs, what would you do? You might stop, even though you're under no legal obligation, because you know it's in your self-best interest. If I told you that Arizona's going to pass a law removing speed limits from the freeways, it's going to be like the Autobahn, you can drive as fast as you want. How fast will you drive? How fast will you drive? Pretty slow. Oh, I'm a pretty driver. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where are my freeway flyers? How fast would you drive? I do like 80. 80. What do you do now? Seven. About 80. Yeah. What, how fast will you drive? <laughs> well, when you're like still kind of in the city, it's technically 65. No, I said there's no speed limit anymore. Okay, well then, I usually go like, I usually go like 90, so maybe I'd push like 100 or so. And how long will you drive at 100 miles an hour? I don't know, to where I'm going. I guarantee you, you won't. Really? Yeah. What if I put cruise control on? <laughs> You'll take it off. You know why? Why? Okay. How many people have driven at 100 miles an hour? How long did you stay at it? Not long at all. For what reason? Uh, other cars. Other cars, number one. It's not in your self-best interest to be driving. Because the difference in stopping distance between 80 and 100 is astronomical. Okay, it's not safe. You'll only drive as fast as you feel comfortable and safe. Thank you for only driving 80 miles. <laughs> the fastest I've ever driven in, in, in a car is 120 miles an hour. And I did this in 1967. Uh, I was driving from L.A. to El Paso, Texas driving through New Mexico when they had just completed the 10 freeway. It was a perfectly beautiful blacktop road through the desert, and the New Mexico desert has nothing on either side of it. There are no rocks. There's not even tumbleweed. There's nothing but sand. So if you went off the freeway, you got stuck in the sand. You couldn't even get hurt. There wasn't even a drop-off. The sand and the freeway were level in those days. I drew it. But you know what happens after a while doing 120 miles an hour? You get nervous. And I wasn't even worried about a ticket. It was you know, dead in the morning because you drive the desert you know, when it's cool in the morning. No cops. I, I, did, I drove across the whole state of Mexico and never saw another car. So it wasn't that. It's just it's too fast. On a motorcycle, the fastest I've ever gone is 110. My friend and I were driving uh, up to Mammoth and we're on 395. And, uh, we opened the bikes. And we looked down, we're doing 110. I looked at him, he looked at me, and we let go of the throttle. You've got to be insane. 10% of your tires on the road. A, a, a piece of gravel will kill you. Okay? So you only do those things that you think are in your self best interest. How fast are you going to drive? Well, I race cars, so. You what? I race cars. I know, but if you're, you're on the freeway, you're on the 10 freeway, there's no speed limit. How fast are you going to go for how long? As fast as the car will go. Fast is for how long? Until it's not in my best interest. Yeah, it's not, you see, that's, that's the secret. So it's not in your best interest. Listen, if you think you can get away with violating a 
civil law and gain something from it, most of you will. Did we talk about the wallet in the parking lot in here? Yeah. You know, most of you are thieves. Once the money gets big enough, you'll steal it. If you think you can get away with it. But if you think you're going to get caught, you won't. So what does that tell you? Even though you're voluntarily complying with the law, if there isn't a force behind the law to make violating it unpleasant, you may not obey it. Because you always want to move towards the good, which is pleasure as opposed to pain. You know, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Basically, that means the pleasure derived from breaking the law is going to be less than the pain you suffer if you get caught. And that's what keeps most of us on. You know why this locks on doors? Look at this lock. Okay, I locked the door. You come to the door and you wiggle the handle, the door's locked, what do you do? You keep walking. If I'm a thief, what do I do? Try to break in. I break the window. Locks are not to stop thieves from stealing things. It's to remove the temptation from basically honest people. I mean, think about it. It's really what it is. I know we like to think we're basically honest when we're honest because it's part of our character as Aristotle would have it. But sometimes I think we're honest because we're afraid of getting caught and breaking the law. And that's Locke's position, by the way. A law without something to enforce it is not worth the paper it's written on. Divine law, well that's simple, that's God's law. Now, the problem with God's law is who the hell knows what it is. Thank you. And guess what we are not? God. God's law is funny. In, in the respect that the only one who can understand God's law is God. Now, in the Old Testament, there are 613 laws. When it's said that Jews are the people of the book, they mean they're the people of the 613 laws. And these are God's laws. But if you look at the 613 laws, and if you look at the most famous of the 613 laws, the Ten Commandments, most of them are civil laws. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Right? What else is there? Don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't covet your neighbor. And I forgot the sixth one offhand. But only three of them are about the relationship to God. I am the only God, I have no graven images, don't worship anybody. Keep the Sabbath and don't screw around and take my name in vain. The other seven, I think, are all civil laws. So who knows what God's law is? That's another argument, as that God is actually a, con a, con a concoction of man's mind. If I want to control a society, I need an authoritarian figure. And what's the best authoritarian figure to have? Eternal. An invisible, Eternal. all-powerful God. Who sees everything you do. And that's interesting to make God's all seeing. Uh, for those who aren't parents, when you do have kids, if you can convince your kids you know what they're doing even when you're not there, you'll understand how God works in society as a whole. Because if the kid thinks you know what he's doing when he's not there, how do they behave? As though you're watching them. If you ever convince your kid of this, you got it made, they won't lie to you much. My son screwed up at school and they called me. So now I know he's had got in trouble at school. Comes home and hi, how how'd they go? Oh fine. Anything unusual happened? No. So what do I know the kid's doing now? Nothing. Not lying yet. But he ain't telling me the truth. And I nailed his ass. And he didn't understand at the moment that they called me. So if you can convince the kids you know what's happening even when you're not there. Because I know what happened to me. I got in trouble at school my father knew. How did my father know I got in trouble at school? He's at work. Divine law. <clears throat> Interesting concept. Okay.
Okay, so you understand the three different types of law, three different types of knowledge. Well, time goes by fast when you're having fun. Uh, now to his political philosophy. Did you hear that or just me hallucinating? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, there are four basic uh, political questions that have to be asked in political philosophy. What is the origin of government? What is the purpose of government? What legitimates the power and authority of government? And why is a citizen under an obligation to obey the laws? Those are four basic questions you always have to answer when you're talking about political philosophy. And boy, it's sort of appropriate considering we had the election on Tuesday that we get to this point. What is the origin? come together to form a society to begin with? Think of all the reasons why people come together to form a society. Organization and power. Organization and distribution of power. What else? What other reasons we form societies? Self-interest. Self-interest. Well, what kind of self-interest? Well, you don't have access to... You have to speak up. You don't have, you don't have access to different goods and services. Ah, different goods and services. And the reason you get to have access to different goods and services is because you have a division of labor. What does that mean? That means, left to my own devices, I wouldn't survive. I need someone to build me a house, a shelter, I need someone to put in the plumbing, put in the electricity, put up the walls. I need someone to generate the electricity, someone to grow food, someone to butcher animals because I can't do it myself. And we're all that way. Division of labor makes life really possible. There's another reason why we form societies. And let me ask the question this way. <clears throat> Why do horses travel in herds? Why do horses travel in herds? Are they to be attacked by predators? Safety numbers. Does a horse have a choice about living in a herd? No, it's instinctual. Horses, by nature, are herding animals. Cows are herding animals. Birds are flock animals. Some fish travel in schools. Do they have a choice about it? No. It's built into their genes. Just like some animals are solitary. It's built into their genes. Some animals mate for long periods of time with the same mate. They don't have different mates every season. It's genetic. Well, guess what? You know why man forms a society? Because it's in our genes. We are, as Aristotle and Plato say, a social animal. But forgetting that for the moment, because remember, this is the 17th century, not the 21st century. What is the origin of government? Well, the origin of government is people come together for a very a variety of reasons. <clears throat> what is the purpose of government? Well, this has lots of answers, uh, but let's look again at the animals. Why do horses travel in herds? Who benefits from horses traveling in herds? The strongest or the weakest? The weakest. The weakest. And that's true for every herd animal. And who are the weakest in, that, in, a, in a herd? Children. The offspring in there? The youngest and the oldest. Mm, no, the herd doesn't protect the oldest. It protects the youngest and their mothers. The two weakest links within the group are mothers and their offspring. So all herd animals are that way. Well, if you say a, a, a human society is in fact a herd, then what should be the purpose? Protect women and children. To protect the weakest members. If in fact we're animals, and we're along the same evolutionary line, and herd animals is for the, the people, the, the, the animals that benefit the most are the weakest, then our society should be doing what? Protecting the weakest. 
What legitimates the power and authority of the government? That's based on the nature of the contract that's agreed upon to form the government, and we'll get into that. And why is the citizen under an obligation to obey the laws? So there's consistency. So you know we'll get you in trouble and won't. We'll protect you from the strongest. In our particular society, our laws are set up, are set up to protect whom? The richest. Not rigid. Our society is set up to protect the rights of the and minorities. If you think about and read the ten, the ten uh, amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, they protect minorities. Everything in our Constitution since the development of the Constitution is to protect minorities. Not majority rule. Not majority rule. And how do you know that? Look at the Electoral College. You can win the popular vote by 10 million votes and still lose the presidency. It's not majority rules in our society. Our society is a set up to protect minorities. Our society, our legal system, is set up to what? Prosecute the guilty and protect the innocent. Protect the innocent. In our society, better that you let 10 guilty people go than convict one innocent person. Now, other societies are set up differently, but this is how we would answer these questions. Why do you have an obligation to obey the laws? Because it's in your own self-best interest. And so when a law is passed that you don't consider in your self-best interest, the people as a whole don't obey the law. What are some examples in our society? Prohibition. Prohibition. We had a law making booze illegal. What was the result of that? More booze. Not more booze. Organized crime. Because people violated that law. For... Since the 1930s, marijuana has been illegal. Prior to that, it was legal in this country, marijuana. Totally legal. Until the Stamp Act in the 1930s. But what do people still do? They smoke marijuana. Because they don't think the law is in self-best interest. If you look at the history, laws legislating morality fail. Because the populace don't think those laws are in their self-best interest. So they ignore them. And what that means, there's now less respect for the law. Every law that's passed that's disobeyed by the members of the society denigrates all other laws. And our great uh, result of prohibition, the great legacy of prohibition, is organized crime when we still have it. So why is a citizen under an obligation to obey the laws? It's in their self-best interest. Now, in the 17th century, uh, People are asking questions about uh, the law. What time is our class over? 25 and after. Okay. Someone remember where I left off. Uh, for those who came in late, you need to sign the roll sheet. <clears throat>